So it is my great, great pleasure to welcome everybody officially now to Learn and Lunch North, uh, our spring series, Women in Faith. And as I said, and, and thank we welcome you from the Jewish Federation of Dutchess County. My name is Karen Hockhauser. I will change my name so that way you can always remember it. <laughs> and uh, with that, it gives me great pleasure, my partner in crime, uh, Pastor Luis Perez, to officially welcome you. Pastor. Thank you, Karen, for those lovely words and for doing a meaningful uh, job in hosting, opening <laughs> these meetings and technologically setting us up. And uh, it's been a true pleasure to journey with you and the Jewish Federations of Dutchess uh, County. Um, today marks the end of our exploration of this topic of women in faith. I'd uh, like to like, uh, thank all the fellow learners who have joined us on this journey of spiritual and intellectual growth. As always, we would want you to be the ones uh, shaping the programming uh, for the fall when we reconvene. Perhaps we'll have a hybrid model part Zoom and part in person in our fellowship hall where we'll have a wonderful kosher meal waiting for you. I'm trying to do whatever I can to lure you back um, um, and to deepen our friendship through hospitality, right? Because that's part of it. We wanna deepen our connections as friends. Um, we are thinking of either exploring the topic of the Jewish sacred teachings on immigration. We know that right now domestically we have a very a uh, messy situation at the southern border, or we're thinking of looking at um, the ongoing conflict um, uh, in, in Israel uh, uh, involving these terrorism attacks and what role as Christians we can play to contribute to uh, peace as well as the importance of upholding and keeping Israel before us. We're thinking about those two topics. Dr. Tilton, as we know, is a world-class scholar. He is adept at discussing these issues um, but we want you to help pick. So what we're gonna ask you to do is when uh, you have time, email Karen. Uh, for those of you who uh, you already registered with her, propose, uh, share with her which one of these two topics may intellectually and spiritually appeal to you. Um, or if there's another topic that you feel moved in the spirit to share as well, share it with her. Uh, those who are connected to our church, you can share with me as well. So when I meet with Karen uh, to define the agenda and the topic, with Dr. Chilton's uh, input and support, we can have uh, something that, uh, that attracts our fellow learners. We want, we want to study something that appeals to you. So uh, with no further ado, I'm gonna introduce Dr. Chilton who doesn't need an introduction. He's been our uh, academic and spiritual mentor for the last two or three years that we've been working together. He is a renowned world-class scholar who teaches at Bard, but has taught at Yale um, in the past, a big loss for, our, uh, for my alma mater. And I also, at the last time around, I sent a special shout out to Cantor Bob Cohen as one of my heroes. And I wanna say that I also have other heroes, including Arlene Wilhelm and Gail Berger, who I'm glad to see here. Both of them have played a, a pivotal role in shaping my ministry. And it's a proposed that we're discussing women in faith. There are two people who I deeply admire and respect, and I'm glad to be able to journey with them. No further ado, Dr. Chilton. Thank you very much, both to Pastor Luis and to Karen. I really like this contraption. I feel as if I should be flying an airplane, which I never have done, but I'm sure it would be most amusing to do. Uh, I am with mixed feelings because this is the last of this series, but I very much look forward to picking up our discussion in the autumn with at least more people uh, present as we make this shift. I agree with Pastor Luis that we should have a hybrid model. I've been doing the same thing at Bard College. And uh, although it is demanding and the technology is, shall we say, interesting, that seems to be the most equitable way of moving ahead. For the close of this series on women of faith, I've chosen two figures, rough contemporaries, uh, Trudy Weiss Rosemarin was born in 1908, Eleanor Roosevelt in 1884. Two contemporaries who were remarkable for their independence of mind and also for the precision of their thought. I was saying to Karen and Pastor Luis 
that it's a longer handout than usual because both Trudy Rice Rosemara and Eleanor Roosevelt thought in paragraphs. They, they did not, like Franklin Delano Roosevelt, think in sound bites. They developed entire thoughts. So one has to stay with them uh, in order to understand how it is that they came to the positions that they did. Let me say from the outset that the positions they arrived at are not the same as I would arrive at today. And there's plenty to disagree with, and not only because of their time frame, but because of their perspectives. So I am not arguing that they are entirely correct in everything that they say about issues that existed in their time and that still exist. But even when I disagree with them, it seems to me that they have something profoundly important to say, and that joining them in the journey of insight is always extraordinarily rewarding. So let me start with Trudy Weiss Rosemary, since most people have not heard of her. And yet, she had a remarkable itinerary. Uh, she was born in Germany, in Frankfurt am Main. Uh, she was a dedicated Zionist for all of her conscious life within her upbringing. Uh, and as such, uh, she was committed to the idea of learning Hebrew, which she did to a very high standard at a time when that was not exactly common, and to a development of the understanding of Jewish culture as well as Jewish religion. She was so dedicated on this course uh, that she attempted to run away from home and emigrate to Israel, but caught pneumonia in the process and th so found herself back home again. And in the course of her recuperation, found that she was more and more interested, not only in Hebrew, but in other Semitic languages. So she did something at the time, which was extraordinarily uncommon for any student, and in particular, for a woman student. She specialized in Semitic languages of all kinds and proceeded to study at several German universities uh, until in 1931, she received her doctorate from the University of Würzburg. A Jewish woman received her doctorate from the University of Würzburg. Now, she also clearly understood something, namely, no German university was going to give her a job in that area, nor was any Jew German university likely to give her a job in any area during the 1930s. So at this stage, with her husband, hence the Rosemary part of her name, she emigrated to the United States. Her PhD thesis was published uh, the title of the thesis is actually of interest, given the positions that she evolved over the course of time. The thesis was on references to Arabs, that is not Jews alone, but references to Arabs, meaning Western Semitic speakers in the literature of ancient Assyria and Babylonia. This is still regarded as a standard within the field. But she had not reckoned that in the United States there was prejudice too, and she could not get an academic job. And uh, frankly, she went to New York. She might have been better off trying at Johns Hopkins at the time, but in any case, she was in New York, realized that she was not gonna get an academic appointment, and therefore she started her own school. And the purpose of the school was particularly directed to the cultivation of Jewish culture among women. The honorary chair of her school was a scientist whose name was Albert Einstein. And the school prospered for a number of years. And she began producing a newsletter, uh, which came to be called the Jewish Spectator, which was the standard magazine of reference 
within Jewish life for a period of 50 years. And her principal contribution lay in writing articles and editorials uh, for the Jewish Spectator. And uh, one of them, as I have in the handout, came in a fateful year, 1967, uh, the year of the Six Day War. Several months after that war, uh, she read, wrote her article called Toward Jewish Muslim Dialogue, from which I've given you an excerpt. And I'm just going to see what happens when I attempt to share the screen. A little bit of luck, this will work out. There we are. Uh, you can see her article in September. This is just months after uh, the Six Day War, uh, which had seemed to be going against the forces of the Israel Defense Force, uh, but then in fact uh, resulted in an increase of the territory held by the state of Israel. And in a typical fashion, Trudy Weiss Rosemarin moves in exactly a contrary direction. Uh, she here argues against the idea, despite the recent war, against the idea of continued war with what she calls the Arab world. And in particular, she was disturbed by the way in which thought in Israel was attempting to define the state in terms of Europe, when in her view, it should be defined in terms of the Middle East. And so she writes, if the young state of Israel is to survive and prosper, it must become integrated into the Arab world and accepted by its neighbors. The crucial challenge confronting Israel is how to conclude an alliance of peace with the Arab nations. We believe that with a complete reorientation, especially a muting of the insistent harping on the theme of Israel as an outpost of Western civilization, the Arab nations would accept Israel on the basis of the kinship which unites Jews and Arabs. And then if we go down to the next paragraph, I have no sympathy for this chauvinism propagated mainly by Israelis of German Jewish origin. I believe it would be good if Israel were to become an Oriental country in the connotation of the term during the Middle Ages when the Arab Jewish symbiosis was flowering. What she alludes to here is a theme that she uh, expands on within this article, which is the way in which both Muslim culture and Jewish culture experience the Spanish Inquisition as a trauma. We have repeatedly referred to this theme ourselves, as we've seen the ways in which uh, both Jews and Christians found their faith distorted as a result of the Inquisition. Uh, so she argues that in that there was a shared trauma, there is a natural kinship among Jews and Arabs at the level of language, as well as at the level of culture. And she also argued that there was a symbiosis at the level of religion. Now here, I have to tell you, I'm just having a technical problem in getting the page, there it goes, getting the page to advance, but now it has, so it's been okay. Uh, so as she says, the way in which Judaism develops is similar to the way in which Islam develops in the sense that these are not just religions, but they are religions. In addition to their religious orientation, they also have languages of their own and they've got specific cultures. So she sees these as holistic entities which have a natural kinship especially because, as she says at the top of page two, last but not least, while the so-called Judeo-Christian civilization is a contradiction in terms, since Christianity presses its authenticity on the claim of the 
abrogation of Judaism, today a Muslim civilization has been a blessing to both components. This is one of her pithy statements, uh, which is expanded elsewhere through this article. But you know, it calls attention to what I believe is an important feature of Jewish Christian dialogue, which is often overlooked. I personally do not agree with her that there is a contradiction in Jewish Christian dialogue. Otherwise I would not have done it as I have for most of the past three decades. On the other hand, there is without question a line of argument within Christianity that sees Christianity as being the formal replacement of Judaism. And I think that Trudy Weiss Rosemarin was right in saying there really isn't any kind of compromise with that position. And that as a matter of responsibility, Jews should resist that kind of dialogue if what the dialogue really is, is a claim that one side should take the place of the other. And she believed that there is, to the contrary, as she says, an organic bond and a natural affinity and empathy between Jewish culture and Arab Islamic culture. This week, of course, this is an especially poignant statement since the recent outbreak of violence in the Middle East is now hitting populations of Israeli Arabs against Israeli Jews. We're seeing the beginnings of what could formally become a civil war, which is one of the most distressing developments I have ever seen. I was just listening this morning as it happens to commentary by Rami Yunis, a Palestinian Israeli uh, whom I met on my last visit to Jerusalem. And uh, he provides a heartbreaking analysis of how it is that the sides are forming up to be the very opposite of what Trudy Weiss Rosemarin is talking about, namely polar antagonists. But her argument is that theologically speaking, there's a natural affinity theologically between Judaism and Islam that ought to be exploited as a means of making peace. Uh, and so she closes her analysis by saying, Israel will never be able to secure its frontiers by force of arms and with the aid of the United States and the United Nations. The road which will lead Israel to peace with its Arab neighbors is not the path of coexistence, but of a cultural symbiosis in which once again, as in the past, Jewish culture and Arab culture will blend and coalesce while yet retaining their unique and distinct qualities. Now this idea that she has of coalescence has got two features. Uh, one of them is that she believes that it is important for any civilization, whether it is the civilization of Judaism, of Islam, of Christianity, whatever it is, any civilization grows by means of what she's happy to call assimilation. And this interest she had in assimilation goes back to her teens when she became interested in Zionism. But she makes a distinction between what she calls active assimilation and passive assimilation. What she means by that is any culture as it grows learns from other cultures. And it makes a positive decision to implement the features of that culture. So for example, as a result of Christian contact with Muslim uh, culture during the Crusades, we figured out that really it's much, much better to do your mathematical computations with what we still call Arabic numerals. Uh, no one could plausibly argue that we should stop using Arabic numerals and go back to Roman numerals uh, because we didn't invent them. But the, that assimilation is what she would call positive assimilation. On the other hand, there's what she calls a negative assimilation. That is when a member of a minority group feels compelled to drop its culture 
in order to be absorbed in the whole. The coalescence of one culture and another is not the same as absorption, is not the same of, as a denial of identity. So what she is looking for in particular is a situation in which Jewish culture adapts in its new setting in the state of Israel and elsewhere. It's really very interesting. She, although was wanted to go to Israel before it was a state when she was in her teens, when she emigrated, she emigrated first to New York and when she moved again in the late seventies, she moved to California, to Santa Monica. She understood that Jewish culture happens in the diaspora as well as in the state of Israel and that the whole civilization is the richer for that. So that issue of adaptability is one that she sees as being central within any culture. And then she also in the modern period understands that civilizations need national agents in order to survive. Uh, this was one of her arguments for Zionism. And she believed that once the state of Israel existed, then Zionism had reached its conclusion. She didn't believe for a moment that the existence of the state of Israel put the diaspora in doubt, but she thought the state of Israel was necessary for the diaspora. In a similar way, she also believed that a good Zionist would back the efforts of Palestinian nationalism. That is, that the existence of a Palestinian state would actually be in the best interests of the state of Israel, in that it brings to expression cultures which can then enter into their natural symbiosis. So I must say, I find her a challenging, but still provocative and very useful thinker uh, who found the way to her positions on the basis of her extremely deep commitment to the practice of Judaism uh, on an intellectual level, no matter what challenges might exist. Now, I find it interesting that Eleanor Roosevelt is as independent minded, and yet she had much less formal education. Uh, the article I've chosen from her, she wrote in 1932, in December, that is, after her husband's successful election to the presidency, but before his first inaugural address. Uh, the timing of what he ha she has to say here is, in its own way, as interesting as the timing of the article by Trudy Weiss Rosemarin. So Eleanor Roosevelt chooses to write on the topic, what religion means to me. Uh, religion was very much at the center of her reflection for most of her life. I find this interesting because there has been a persistent tendency recently to downplay uh, this part of her reflection. Uh, that's unfortunate because what she's referring to here uh, belong to the very foundation of the way in which she operated. And it started when she was living in Tivoli, just locally, when she went to church at St. Paul's there. And so she says in this article, it is generally conceded that in a world where material values seem to be dropping out of sight further and further, day by day, there is a growing realization that something else is needed. Some of us even feel that amidst the many evils and sorrows and injustices, which are the fruit of what we call the depression, there may be emerging one thing which will be of permanent value to us, namely a new standard which will set above everything else certain spiritual values. In our mad haste, for more and more money and more and more luxury, we had almost forgotten to count these as part of our heritage in this country. Then she goes on to reflect, and yet most of us who are in the 40s and 50s today, she means in the age, not the decades, 
and look back to a childhood, and here she's thinking of Tivoli, where religion and religious instruction were part of our everyday life. But we have come so, so far away from those days that in writing this article, I even feel I must begin by defining what I mean by religion. And here she comes to a remarkably profound and succinct statement. This bear in mind is someone who finished her formal education when she was 18 years old. Uh, she had been homeschooled early on by her grandmother because her parents had died when she was very young. That was in Tivoli. Uh, she had then been sent to a private school in England for a couple of years, actually wished to continue her education there, but was called back from her grandmother so that she could come out in the debutante's ball. Uh, and so all the other insights she acquired, she acquired the hard way by doing it herself. There's a remarkable resilience about her as well as a shyness that she always had to uh, struggle with. To me, she writes, religion has nothing to do with any specific creed or dogma. It means that belief and that faith in the heart of a man, which make him try to live his life according to the highest standard, which he is able to visualize. To those of us who were brought up as Christians, that standard is the life of Christ. And it matters very little whether our creed is Catholic or Protestant. To those of us who happen to have been born and brought up under other skies or in other creeds, the object to be attained goes by some other name. But in all cases, the thing which counts is the striving of the human soul to achieve spiritually the best that it is capable of and care unselfishly not only for personal good, but for the good of all those who toil with them on the earth. So she develops an understanding of what religion is in terms of its transcendence, in terms of the fact that it goes beyond the person, that it goes beyond any particular set of expectations or philosophies. And she was convinced throughout the entire course of her life that this was a common characteristic of humanity itself, which if you brought out, you would able to confront the particular challenges that need to be faced. And what she next comes to say is really quite striking if you bear in mind Franklin Delano Roosevelt's first inaugural address which would only occur several months after this article was published. That was the speech which he began, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. That's just the thing that Eleanor Roosevelt anticipates here. The worst thing that has come to us from the depression is fear, fear of an uncertain future, fear of not being able to meet our problems fear of not being equipped to cope with life as we live it today. We need some of the old religious spirit which said, I myself am weak, but thou art strong, O Lord. That was the spirit which brought people to this country, which settled it, which carried men and women through untold hardships, and which has given us our heritage and comparative ease and comfort. Uh, just to say by Aside, it is striking here that she does very much associate herself with what she explicitly calls elsewhere an Anglo-Saxon mentality and a settler mentality. Uh, that is, at this stage, uh, she is not particularly thinking of Native American religions, though through the course of her life, she would in fact adjust her position. Uh, she's writing at a comparatively early stage and in this article, she is confronting a different challenge from that of diversity. Diversity is something she's aware of, but here she's mostly concerned about the question of motivation. How are people motivated to pull themselves out of their fear? And she does believe that faith 
is the source of that. And here, in this next paragraph, she reflects on her own education. And then she had gone to England. This was a big change to go from Tivoli uh, to the Allenswood School was a huge adjustment for her. And she became devoted to the head of that school, uh, whose name was Marie Silvestre, who was what was called a free thinker. Uh, that is someone who was dedicated to the idea that social action came part and parcel with the growth of education. Uh, and obviously Eleanor Roosevelt assimilated a great deal of this point of view. Uh, when she came back to the United States, she began teaching uh, in what were called settlement houses. That is, people who are immigrants were able to live at very little or no rent and where education didn't exist except for people like volunteers of the sort of Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, she was also associated with the National Consumers Association. Uh, that was an association whose aim was only to purchase products when minimum standards of workers' rights were observed. All of that dedication came out of the influence of Marie Suvestra. But Marie Suvestra articulated this point of view from an atheist perspective. And with this, Eleanor Roosevelt did not agree. And we can see that in this paragraph now that is coming up, where she writes, after I left home and went to school, I came under the influence of a very interesting woman who proclaimed that she had no religion and that the Christians from her point of view were rather to be looked down upon because they did right for gain. It might not be gain in this world, but it was for gain in the next. And therefore, the only people of real virtue were those who believed that there was no future life, but who wished to help those around them to do what was right purely through an interest in their fellow human beings and a desire to see right triumph just because it was right. A point of view which one encounters still, namely the idea that somehow Christianity has an intrinsic selfishness that people need to get over. She goes on, I was too young to come back then with the obvious retort that making those around you happy makes you happy yourself, and that therefore you are seeking a reward just as much as if you were asking for a reward in a future life. And that perhaps what we know as good in life and what we think here of as praiseworthy will not be counted at all as a spiritual achievement by some more understanding judge. That is why we all of us, whether we are willing to acknowledge it or not, do crave the belief in some power greater than ourselves and beyond our understanding because we know in our hearts that deeds and outward things mean little and that only someone who can gauge what striving there has been can really judge of what a human soul has achieved. She was convinced of this idea that there is an organic connection between being human and being a believer in the transcendent, uh, in that which gets us beyond ourselves. And so she gives herself as an example, as an Episcopalian. Part of what she says in this paragraph is kind of fun from the point of view of her relationship between uh, with uh, Franklin Roosevelt, because Franklin Roosevelt was, was not notable for going to church every Sunday. He did from time to time. He always made sure at the time of the inauguration that there was a service of prayers, but he wasn't great on communion. And Eleanor really was. And Eleanor thought she and the children should always go. And Franklin have, was able to find other things to do. So she finds room for people like Franklin. Uh, she once referred to him as a person of faith, but a very simple faith. Uh, she saw her own point of view as being mature. One of the few cases, by the way, where she openly allowed herself 
some criticism of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Uh, but I think in this essay, one can see where she's going and why it is that after the death of Franklin, President Truman would ask her to go to the United Nations on behalf of the United States and why she became pivotal in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Her very last sentence in basically states a direction that she followed through during the next few decades. The fundamental vital thing which must be alive in each human consciousness is the religious teaching that we cannot live for ourselves alone and that as long as we are here on this earth, we are all of us brothers, regardless of race, creed, or color. Not an obvious thing to say in 1932. Not an obvious thing to say in some parts of the world in this year. But it comes directly out of her religious perspective, uh, just as Trudy Weiss Rosemarin found her support of narrow Arab nationalism in her understanding of how it is that human civilizations can function. So thank you for joining me in this uh, investigation of several women of faith over the weeks. I must say, I find these two that we have closed with uh, remarkably encouraging in their ability to think through complex situations and come to a deep seeking and humane result. Thank you, Dr. Chilton. Um, I think of we course. stopped sharing. I think Karen's about to unmute. I will, but why don't we stop sharing so that way we could see everybody's oh, beautiful faces. Of course, that's a very, thank you for that. This is the kind yeah. of thing I always forget. There we are, all righty. Excellent. Um, so we open the question, open the floor to questions. Um, either you can raise your hand, you can unmute yourself. I think everybody should have that ability. Um, I'm looking, looking. I figure Arlene's got at least one question. <laughs> <laughs> She's, she's thinking, she's unpacking all the content. Right, it's being formulated even as we speak. Yeah, I like it, I like it. I mean, we could throw one out of just, you know, circumstances, you know, you can't look at today's circumstances and apply today's circumstances back then, but what would you think either of these women would say about today and what they're seeing? Well, and you mean in particular in the Middle East, yeah? Uh, because this is obviously a burning issue where the conflict between the two sides is now being worked out largely over civilian casualties, where we see two cultures, instead of finding symbiosis, as Trudy Wise Rosemary referred to it, in deep conflict, to the point that in cities and towns where Palestinian Israelis and Jewish Israelis used to live together peaceably, there are nighttime raids of gangs of one group attacking the housing of another group. And it doesn't appear that this is going to get better immediately, uh, even if productive policies are put in place. Now, if, uh, if a person accepts the analysis of Trudy Weiss Rosemarin, then the way forward is by way of a responsible Palestinian state that could live peaceably with the state of Israel. In other words, she was an early representative of the idea of the two state solution. And she was arguing that at precisely the time when you could be tempted from an Israeli point of view to think, no, why don't we simply eliminate this as a threat? And so I was always struck by the courage of her position. And I 
personally have long been in favor of a two-state solution. I'm well aware of its difficulties, uh, especially because now the question emerges, if there were a Palestinian state, who would constitute that state? The Palestinian Authority today controls, if you could say it controls, only what we call the West Bank and not Gaza, uh, which is under the control of a different group namely Hamas. Uh, Hamas has expressed a dedicated purpose to eliminate the state of Israel. So the question emerges, is that what you would want representing a Palestinian state? And what, what would you do about a Palestinian state that took that to be its policy? I think that helps to explain why this is enormously delicate question. The problem is it's a delicate question which then various politicians have found it convenient to use uh, in order to bolster support among their own constituencies. And when that occurs, people find themselves taking insensitive positions in a situation where delicacy is required. So whatever can be done, it seems to me, to sort out the divide in Palestinian politics, on the one hand, between Hamas and the Palestinian Authority, and also within Israeli policy. Because after all, Israel has been through several elections over the past year and a bit, it is even now in an interim situation. And that's part of the problem. I mean, you have someone who is the current prime minister who sees a way forward in conflict. And you have someone on in Hamas. Hamas has been losing support in Gaza. And we all know that there's nothing, there's no way as efficient as gaining support as going to war. You know, war suddenly makes an inadequate leader appear to be necessary. So I, I think that one of the difficulties is that political advantage is being mixed up with the cultural problem. Uh, and I can only hope that over time, uh, through considered discussion within the United Nations and elsewhere, I think Trudy Weiss Rosemarin is right. You can't rely on the United Nations alone, but I, I don't see that there's an, uh, another viable forum right now uh, in order to discuss how to stop the violence and then bring about a situation where it will not break out again. So my hand is up. I see it. I love that hand raising. I have, I have, I formulated my question, I think. <laughs> the question is this, uh, as I listened to your lecture on, on Trudy and Eleanor and kind of comparing them, uh, Trudy was more of an intellectual. Uh, she had the education, but I see Eleanor as a, a hands on, feet on the ground, living out what she believed and what she taught, you know, what, what she spoke. Uh, so you, not that you don't, you need both, you need both. Uh, you need to have a foundation. I mean, some of her, found, some of Eleanor's foundation came from her Episcopal education and also from the influence of people in her life that formed her spiritually to come to her position. Uh, so they, they came out of two different ways, as you said. Uh, is that, would, would that be a fair uh, analysis of what you said? Yeah, I, I think it is a fair analysis. What I also find interesting is that although Eleanor Roosevelt begins with the practical and the pragmatic, uh, she moved increasingly into the intellectual. Yeah. Whereas in the case of Trudy Weiss Rosemary, and it was the opposite. And, and so look at what it results in their doing. Uh, in the case of Eleanor Roosevelt, one of her initiatives uh, during the period leading up to the depression 
was the foundation of the furniture factory at Ball Kill. Yeah, right. You know, whose aim was quite simply to give work. And so I think that exemplifies that part of her, which was deeply pragmatic. Uh, you know, during the same period, she gets married to Franklin Roosevelt, they have children. Uh, and it was with a certain degree of reluctance that she became a public first lady. But then once she did, of course, she, she did that with a vengeance, right? right. She, she got a taste for it. Uh, she did not at first intervene in matters of policy, but she certainly pressed everyone around her, including her husband, uh, over issues of racism, over issues also of opening the borders of the United States to immigrants because of the refugee problem during the Second World War. So she was far more a leading figure in that regard inside the administration than most of FDR's advisors. And in order to mount these positions, she had to argue and she did very well indeed. And, and you know, the remarkable confidence, I mean, she sits across from a young John F. Kennedy running to be president in 1960 and explains to him why she doesn't think he's really serious enough to be president. And he has to come up with, with arguments to suggest that she could perhaps rethink this. Uh, and in, in the end, in fact, he did what every politician does. He makes her head of a commission, right? <laughs> in, order, in order to show how seriously he, he took her. But I, I think he heard that criticism as did others. On the other hand, Trudy Wise Rosemary, when she comes to the United States and, you know, can't get the academic job because, you know, she has a PhD in 1931. This is pretty rare. And, and she could reasonably have supposed that this entitled her to have an academic job in New York. All right, Johns Hopkins is not here, but Columbia is, you know, his seriology is taught there. And it, it didn't work. And in, instead of folding up or instead of moving on further, or, or interestingly, I don't know whether it would have been viable for her to try going to what was then called Palestine to find an academic job. But I somehow doubt it because in the early years of the Hebrew University, which some of you remember we, we talked about in reference to Gershom Sholem uh, last year, Hebrew University was very much in the mold of German universities. And although it had no, obviously it had no problem hiring Jews, women, not so much. And so, you know, she had that double prejudice against her uh, in the United States. And I think that there was the issue of sexism in the developing academic scene in Israel. But instead of quitting, she founded what was basically a much more elementary school, especially for Jewish women. And she made that her career. Uh, continuing, by the way, to write articles, you know, showing, showing that she kept her hand in on the side of Assyriology, uh, but also developing a more practical side. And she became a central figure in the Jewish feminist movement. Uh, that was an issue I didn't take up within the particular article I chose, but that was another part of her influence as a result of the Jewish spectator. Herman has his hand up now, if you'll unmute yourself. In the recent uh, television series, Atlantic Crossing, Eleanor is port portrayed as being reluctant to help the Europeans who needed help, particularly Norway, but other uh, countries as well. Uh, much more reluctant than Franklin. I wonder if that rings true to you. It didn't to me. Yeah, I would. I would make a distinction in terms of Eleanor Roosevelt's attitudes uh, and indeed Franklin Roosevelt's. Uh, I did not see uh, too much of that series, uh, but what I did see of it uh, portrayed uh, Franklin 
as being much more carefree <laughs> uh, in regard to actions that could annoy the Third Reich uh, than I think he really was. So I think there was a tendency in the series uh, to give a rosier picture of Franklin Roosevelt, who I think understood that American neutrality put certain inhibitions on him at that early stage in the war. Uh, and on, on the side of Eleanor, I would make a distinction. And actually, I think this distinction is something that prevailed through most of her life. Uh, where it concerned actions for refugees, I think that she was far more accommodating than Franklin Delano Roosevelt was and pressed for an openness to immigration, which would have been seen as progressive in almost any period. But, but where it concerns uh, confrontation and especially military confrontation, I think that Eleanor was far more cautious than Franklin Roosevelt. Uh, so that the Norway question uh, was, I think, in her mind, more an issue of confrontation uh, than it was the uh, saving of the lives of refugees. I know um, PBS <clears throat> Masterpiece has put out uh, a, a, an, an email saying they're going to do a lot of discussion on some of these different facets. So that may be some <clears throat> extracurricular reading we can do to, to see how they interpret what is actually in this movie. Right. That would be, that would be very interesting indeed. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. And I thought one of the good things about the film, uh, I must say, I, I think I stopped watching it because I wasn't convinced by the FDR, right? <laughs> I, think, I think the actor's great, but he's not FDR for me. Uh, but... Uh, I think one of the good things about the film is it opens up a field of the war, uh, which is often not explored and which Churchill thought was extremely important in the early going. I mean, Churchill certainly wanted us there, but there was no way that the United States could have done anything for Norway at that stage in the war, given the political position in the United States. Does anybody have any other questions? See, this is the, the beauty of uh, the, the longer content. We get to learn so much more during the process. There you go. <laughs> With the handouts. Um, <laughs> well, if there are no other questions, um, I, as, as Pastor Luis uh, said earlier, please do let us know if you have any topics uh, that are of interest for the fall. Um, the thought of being hybrid is wonderful because we can still, we can see those who want to come together and those who want to stay at home can mm -hmm. still join us, which is a wonderful thing. Um, so we will figure all that out. A few upcoming events because what is uh, one of, what, what are one of these without knowing that we can get together again virtually? Uh, the Jewish Federation will be hosting our movie night in on May 27th, the Red Sea Diving Resort, which is about the Israeli Mossad agents working with Ethiopians to get them out of um, out of Africa and to Israel. And I think one of the, the people said this was the first mass migration of Africans who came into another country as citizens and not in chains. And I'm paraphrasing, but that's a oh. powerful, powerful statement. But the more interesting part is on, oh, sorry, go ahead. What were you gonna say, Dr. Chilton? I was going to say, not counting Lucy, but anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Not a worry. Love it. Um, and then on June 6th at 2 o'clock, we are going to be having a special panel, including uh, Donny Limore, who was the Mossad, one of the Mossad agents involved in this operation. Yep. He'll be calling in. Uh, it'll be virtual from Israel. 
And Rafi Berg, who wrote the book uh, about this that became the movie, and he's gonna call in from the UK. So um, it'll be a very international panel. We hope you'll join us. There are some other interesting events coming up. May 19th, uh, we are collaborating with the Poughkeepsie Library to do um, an evening with author Jennifer Rosner, who wrote The Yellow Bird Sings, about um, a woman and her love uh, for her child during, you know, and what decisions that had to be made during the Holocaust. There's also, and we're not, we're sharing it with the community, but it's not us, a, a concert for resilience and hope, uh, presenting stories of survival and loss through the eye. Um, if I didn't mention it, May 19th, sorry, May 19th at 7 p.m. is the author, um, again, virtual. But May 23rd, 4 p.m., a concert for resilience and hope presenting stories of survival and loss through the eyes of survivors living in the Hudson Valley who were children during the Holocaust. So it's a really very interesting concept and program um, and that we want to share. It's still our mitzvah now, our Good Deeds Now serial counts. So please feel free. We, we do, if you're up north, uh, the Rhinebeck Jewish Center is one of the collection points. Uh, if you are in Poughkeepsie or South, we have different locations collecting in the Federation, obviously, as well. Then um, in June, we are going to have a distribution day where we're going to distribute to different pantries, including the Rhinebeck Reform Church pantry. So please feel free to get your, I have to, I can't believe I actually have to say this, unopened, unexpired boxes of cereal and uh, shelf stable milk, what we would know as UHT milk, uh, to help those in need. But on that happy note, uh, stay safe, stay healthy. Um, for those celebrating, happy upcoming Shavuot. Get your ice cream in and your cheesecake. We always call it the cheesecake holiday. But uh, we wish everybody a wonderful weekend. And thank you, Dr. Bruce Chilton, again, for leading us through an amazing journey over the ages. Um, always a joy listening to you. Always learn so much. Um, and thank you, Pastor Luis Perez from the Rhinebeck Reform Church for, for helping make all of this happening and bringing us together. And with that, we say goodbye and we look forward to seeing you soon. Absolutely. Have a good weekend, everybody. Take care.